I'm going to show you a game where the world champion Magnus Carlsen gets into a spot of trouble. This was from round six of the Norway chess tournament. He was playing black against Wesley So. Now, going into this game, Carlsen had gone 12 games undefeated against Wesley. And the day before, Carlsen had actually said, to be honest, usually nothing happens in these games. I can't remember him ever being close to beat me. If I want a draw, I will often get it easily. Well, this is a, a, almost a, this is a statement of fact, actually. Um, Wesley is a very solid player and Carlson hasn't had any difficulty playing against him in the past. However, this, of course, heaps so much pressure on yourself by, by saying this. Let's see what happened in the game. Wesley so with the white pieces. Open with d4 and Carlson plays a Slav. Well, yeah, he has played this occasionally. Uh, I mean, he plays everything with black, so he's very unpredictable. And Wesley, true to form, played something absolutely rock solid. The, the exchange variation. And, well, he said after the game that he'd studied it quite recently. So, you know, why not put his study into practice? But is it the best way to try and play for a win against uh, someone like Carlson? Well, let's see. And Carlson now played a6. I mean, the old move here was simply to play symmetrically and, and play bishop f5. But a6 is, is quite common, actually. And because this position often arise, arises from the Chebanenko variation, where black plays a6 very early anyway. And the idea is that after e3, the, the, the normal move to develop your kingside pieces, then black plays bishop g4, pinning. And then black exchanges off bishop for knight and plays e6 and bishop d6. And actually, black is, is completely solid, absolutely fine. And with only one bishop on the board uh, on f1, it's it's hard for white to make any winning uh, chances there at all. Um, and indeed, with two knights against a bishop and knight, sometimes you know, the position is unbalanced. So that accounts for Wesley's move order here, rook c1. So that means that if bishop g4, of course, you can just play knight e5 because there's no pin. And this, of course, is very pleasant for white with this bishop dangling on g4. So therefore, bishop f5, this is the normal move from Carlsen. And rook c8 also looks absolutely fine. I mean, this is a very standard position. It's been played actually hundreds of times. And here, bishop d6 is the most popular move, but... I wouldn't say this gives black easier quality because after knight a4 you can see that white manages to exploit the slight downside of a6 that b6 and c5 are a little bit weaker. So that's why Carson played knight d7 to cover those squares. I guess the downside of this is that you're not exchanging off this wonderful bishop on f4, which casts its eye down this diagonal and takes very important squares away from black's major pieces. So knight a4 is a good move here, looking at the outpost. I mean, this, this is the big aim for both sides in this position. Now, a subtle bit of move order here. Um, Wesley was very careful. He said... He wanted to play a3 and then b4 to take extra control over the c5 square. But after a3, g5, and then h5, when you castle very early and your opponent hasn't castled, of course, you have to take great care. And there's a rook here that these pawns, the pawns don't launch themselves forward. And this is indeed quite a dangerous initiative for black. Therefore, h3, and the idea is that if g5 now, then you can play knight d2, and, and basically white is in time to stop this attack. After g4, this can actually be taken. It's still quite tricky, but basically white can get away with this. Yeah, it's a good job the bishop is here, otherwise there'd be 
between h4. So coming back to this position, Magnus didn't chance his arm with g5 and simply castle kingside. And a3. And Wesley said he was very happy with this position because he knew that he was slightly better. Uh, I mean, I think it's obvious to see. Um, a critical move here, actually, is b5. If black can get this in successfully, then he's doing fine. But after this, you can see that... Well, white has this passed pawn here. Of course, he'd like to play b4 to protect that. But a very important move is that he's going to play knight d4 very soon. And, yes, if you can exchange off that blockader, very nice blockader on c6, then white is certainly doing quite well. Therefore, Magnus played knight a5. So he's also going for the outpost. Knight c4. Uh, knight c5, rather, and then knight c4. So both knights there. It's a slightly strange situation. Um, so... Wesley now played b4. If he takes this knight straight away, then this just leads to equality, actually, after all these exchanges, and so on. So instead he played b4 to support the knight on c uh, c5. So Carlson now exchanged off the knight. Of course, it, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable living with this knight on c5, particularly when after b6, you're going to have to, yeah, well, knight a6 is possible. So Carson exchanged this off and took an a3. So, he, well, he's sort of won a pawn here. Um, but, well, white is going to get it back after knight d4, this very important move. Hitting the bishop. So Carson needs to move it. And after this, well, he played it to e4 first because he just wanted to induce a little weakness here. Now, that could be very important for the defence later on when the pawn on e3 is weakened a little bit. So knight, the, the knight is now, well, trapped in inverted commas. Basically, it has to decide where it's going to retreat to. Does it retreat to here or here? In both cases, of course, white regains the pawn. So, for example, after knight b5, this actually looks very pleasant for white indeed because... You've got this these this far advanced pawn overlap on the queen side and the bishops. Well, all white pieces look very good here, and in fact, black is very cramped. This is the problem that bishop still, yeah, raking down that diagonal and taking away very important squares from from black's major pieces. So therefore, Carlson put the knight back on c4 and gives gives the pawn back this way, although. In this case, he also lacks a lot of space, but he could have remedied that here if he'd played bishop g5. And you can see that already gives his queen extra possibilities on this diagonal. So after this trade, you can see that pawn just needs a little bit of attention. And then the rook comes into play. This is still pleasant for white. Look at the difference between the minor pieces. That knight would like to come to a5 to hassle the pawn, and it takes a long time for the bishop to get back into the game. I mean, maybe something like queen e7 and f6, and the bishop comes back here. But it takes time, and still not that pleasant. So white definitely better there. But that was certainly Magnus's best chance. He played queen e8, but he miscalculated something. Now, the idea is that you want to play e5. And after takes, then there's a discovered attack on the bishop. So that's why Wesley dropped the bishop to g3. And then e5. So you don't want to just... Let me show that. So you don't want to play this. And then take there. Knight b3. Now here black has quite a choice. I mean, one interesting move is to play e4 and then stick the bishop on f5, and then try and bounce it around here. I mean, this is still very, very pleasant for white. But the bishop, well, is it better on g6 or d7? I don't know. Um, still looks really nice for white. <clears throat> 
Um, and if bishop g5, then just rook here and keeps keeps the position in check. And bishop f6, also interesting, maybe to, to give the queen a square. But then, yeah, just e4, and you can see neither bishop looks particularly good in this position. White is, is better in, in all these positions. But Magnus was looking for something active. So he played bishop d8. I mean, he's <clears throat> hoping to, to bounce this bishop around here and maybe even play b6 at some moment. <clears throat> and the bishop covers a5 too. But he'd overlooked that after this, hitting the b-pawn, bishop takes e5. And now, a simple tactic. He thought the queen takes b4 was possible, but he'd simply overlooked this. And c6 with a discovered attack on the queen. And then you take on b7. Dreadful oversight. Of course, if pawn takes pawn, you can take the queen and there's a pin. So Carlson just had to play bishop e7, just reconnecting the rooks. But now white is just a pawn up for nothing, basically, and with a very pleasant position. Basically, black still lacks space. And with this extra pawn here, it means that white can always just throw the knight into d4 and, and is absolutely rock solid in this position. So if the queen comes back, for example, then yeah, knight d4, um, or yeah, looks, looks really nice at some moment. So bishop f6 played. And e4, and that keeps this one locked out of the game. So Magnus is in a dreadful position now, absolutely dreadful. Knight comes to d4. If the queen goes back, well, it's, it's pretty horrible. Everything's horrible here. So Magnus traded. I mean, maybe on a good day, he's hoping to, <laughs> at some moment, uh, rescue himself by going into some kind of bishops of opposite coloured endgame. But, well, all the major pieces on the board, and this is just a horrible position. Great move from Wesley, g4. The squeeze starts on the king side. This is great. And that means that f5 is prevented, which means this bishop is just dreadfully placed. But yeah, basically, Wesley is starting a lethal attack on black's king. And you can get away with advancing the pawns in front of your king because white controls so much space in this position. And h4, so white is just rolling up on the king side. Magnus looking for counterplay with a5, but it's pretty forlorn. Rook c2 swings the rook over here, that's the idea. But one problem for Wesley was that he was running short of time, and suddenly the position is beginning to open up. Excuse me. I need a slurp of tea. And when the position opens up, there are tactics. And when there are tactics, you need to calculate. So it starts to get tricky. And if things go wrong, then the king is open. G5 must be a good move. I mean, if this is taken here, then the, on G5, then the rook just swings across and, you know, you're in. So tricky move from Magnus, bishop h5, wanting to activate with bishop f3. And this is cr crunch moment. I mean, this must be the correct move. But suddenly, black will start to get a bit of counterplay here. And Wesley must have been just a little bit freaked by this. Actually, should be winning for white because the king is actually very safe if it comes to either... Uh, f2 or h2 so objectively this is the best continuation and it must be winning for white but instead wesley 
he's uh, he's a solid guy. He played G6. Now, there are pros and cons to this move. The, the disadvantage from White's point of view is that you're not breaking through to Black's king straight away. The advantage is that when you get to end games, then the king is just dreadfully placed and there are always going to be problems on the back rank. And that's what Wesley was going for when he played b5. Giving up a pawn but opening up the B file for his major pieces. So he wants to break through and take the B pawn and yeah, get through to the back rank and in combination with the C pawn must be winning. But actually, this was the last move of the time control and Magnus, well, he had a, he had a bit of time, um, but he ran the clock right down so he was under a minute for his last move. And he made a mistake. Queen d7 actually leaves the position still, well, not exactly in the balance, but this requires great technique from white to finish off the game. So, for example, after, well, rook b1, that already allows bishop f3, that's tricky, hitting the e-pawn. And if queen d5, then queen c6, and again, it's this pawn which could potentially be a problem. And don't forget that A pawn just to distract white as well. This is tricky. This is very tricky. I mean, my computer thinks the best move is to play queen d3 to cover the f3 square. But, well, this is not so simple now. Not so simple at all. But Magnus played queen c6. Mistake. That pushed the queen back. And queen d5. So now, well, there's no queen c6 defense, obviously, as in the previous variation. And this b pawn is basically just caving in at some moment. Um, if rook a7, then queen f7 is really strong, just with the idea of playing c6. And you can see breaking through to the back rank. Magnus played a4, but rook takes pawn. It's absolutely hopeless. And now there's a threat to play rook takes pawn and queen f7 and mate on h7. Therefore rook g8. But after c6, Magnus gave up. Extraordinary. And somehow you feel that Magnus was tempting fate after those words from yesterday where he was basically said, well, should, could can get a draw at any stage, but not today. And, and well... To be fair to Magnus, he did congratulate Wesley after the game and said he played excellently when he was interviewed afterwards. And Wesley did play a really, really good game. Um, excellent opening. He was slightly better after the opening. Magnus went wrong and Wesley pushed forward really nicely. Typical game for Wesley, actually. Absolutely rock solid and didn't give Magnus a chance. Now, there was a slight error near the end. But, well, Magnus didn't exploit it, and maybe Wesley would have won anyway. So that leaves, blows the tournament wide open, because now there are two players on plus one, two players with, with, with one win, you could say. Um, so Wesley has had all draws plus, plus one win. Carlson has had two wins and one loss. Slightly confused situation in the tournament, because of course Dingley Wren has withdrawn from the tournament. So some players um, only have two games to play. Some players have three games. So it makes it complicated. But basically, uh, Wesley So and Magnus Carlsen are out there in the lead. But any of the nine players could still win this tournament, theoretically. It's incredible. Um, let me know. Who do you think is going to win the tournament? Comment. Please do comment. Um, and... Please do like if you like the video and of course if you haven't subscribed then please do click the bell and you'll get instant notifications every time I post a video. Um, and also if you want to look in the uh, video description you'll see links to Carlson's last two losses. Um, this is his first loss in 37 games so Magnus has actually been playing really well. Um, his last loss was in the London, last loss in a classical game was in the London Chess Classic against Jan Nepomniczy, 
I should know, I was there, I was commentating on the game. Um, and that was a bit of a collapse for Magnus. And before that, now I might have got this wrong, but I think his last loss was against uh, Bu, you know, the Chinese player, in the World Cup tournament. Anyway, you can find both of those videos in the uh, description. Thanks very much for watching, and yeah, uh, re yeah, rest day tomorrow actually, rest day tomorrow, and see you soon for round seven.